Yes, Chip! Real injuries, real hardships, real tragedies. From heartbreaking retirements to catastrophic accidents to horrifying crimes, these are some of wrestling's most tragic moments. Repackaged as the Blue Blazer, Owen Hart led a storyline crusade against the crass attitudes the WWF was adopting. He was booked to reclaim the Intercontinental Championship from the Godfather at Over the Edge 1999. Hart was supposed to perform a stunt where he'd swoop in from the heavens to comedic effect as he did at Survivor Series 1998. Due to an equipment malfunction, however, he plummeted to the ring below. Medical officials tended to the critically injured Hart as the announcers stalled for time. Later, Jim Ross notified fans of what had happened and announced Hart's death. The event continued, however. Live fans were not updated on Hart's condition. WWF aired its Raw is Owen special in memory of Hart the next night. In October, in a WCW Monday Nitro match dedicated to his brother, Bret Hart defeated Chris Benoit via submission. Owen's widow, Martha Hart, filed a wrongful death lawsuit against the WWF and the stunt team hired for the segment. The proceedings found that Owen was provided unreliable gear meant to be used in yacht racing, and the family reached an $18 million settlement with the WWF in November 2000. Hart's family would go on to found the Owen Hart Foundation, which provides scholarships, food aid, housing assistance, and other services. After debuting for the WWF in 1998, Edge rose up the card. He went from an innovative tag team competitor to a main event act by 2011. As the rated R superstar, he became an 11-time world champion and successfully defended the World Heavyweight Championship at WrestleMania 27 against Alberto Del Rio. A week after the event, Edge announced his retirement due to stenosis of the spine. With the history of neck injuries stemming from a 2002 SmackDown match with Eddie Guerrero, physicians told Edge that a forceful enough fall could kill him. On the April 11, 2011 Raw, Edge closed the show with a promo thanking fans for a career he dreamt of since childhood, and he vacated the World Heavyweight Championship. In a post-broadcast promo, John Cena said of Edge, he was one of those guys who was born to do this. Because I didn't get to end it the way I wanted to. Right. You know, I didn't get to end it on my terms. And I know. Nine years after his retirement, Edge returned as the 21st entrant in the 2020 Royal Rumble match. He made a surprise return after consultation with spinal specialists led to him finally being cleared to perform once again. Edge wrestles today for the Raw brand, and he recently discussed his hopes to retire in front of a hometown Toronto crowd on his own terms. One of All Japan Pro Wrestling's Four Pillars of Heaven, Mitsuharu Misawa began wrestling as Tiger Mask 2 in 1984. He eventually unmasked, and Misawa rose to stardom under his real name, becoming the company's ace throughout the 1990s. In 2000, he led a talent exodus and began pro wrestling Noah. Neck injuries and unhealthy habits resulted in Misawa's physical deterioration. WrestleView reports that rather than getting surgery, he pushed through with acupuncture and chiropractic procedures. In June 2009, Misawa and Go Shiozaki took on GHC Tag Champions Bison Smith and Akatoshi Saito in a title match. Upon taking a back suplex from Saito, Misawa went unconscious. The referee called for the bell, and medical officials tended to Misawa. The promoters made a statement to calm fans, and the show continued. Misawa died that night at a hospital from cervical spinal injuries, the result of years performing the often dangerous King's Road style. Many fans blamed Saito for Misawa's death and harassed him for it, even though Misawa's family said publicly that they didn't hold him responsible. The entire industry mourned the death of Noah's founder, including CM Punk, who wrestled on Raw with Misawa's name written on his taped wrists. Bruiser Brody often performed for Carlos Colon's World Wrestling Council in Puerto Rico in the late 1980s. Another regular there was Jose Gonzalez, who worked in the territory as the Masked Invader 1. Years earlier, the two wrestled elsewhere, with the megastar Brody beating down the then-rookie. A vengeful Gonzalez reportedly vowed to kill Brody for taking liberties with him. At a show in July 1988, Gonzalez led Brody to the shower for a discussion. Tony Atlas, who was in the locker room, says he heard moans of agony and found Gonzalez standing over Brody with a bloody knife. Brody was rushed to the hospital, but the paramedics had arrived late due to traffic from the show. Brody succumbed to his injuries and died. In court, jurors were presented footage depicting Brody in his kayfabe persona, an unhinged, imposing madman. The murder weapon was lost, likely disposed of, and Gonzalez was acquitted of all charges. 
Atlas and another wrestler who was in the locker room, Dutch Mantel, claimed they received their subpoenas to testify after the trial had already ended. Gonzalez has wrestled as recently as August 2022, according to Cage Match. Despite being the biggest star from a legendary wrestling family, Eddie Guerrero was plagued by personal demons. In May 2001, the WWF sent Guerrero to rehab for a painkiller addiction, which meant he sat out the entire invasion angle. Guerrero was released in November after a DUI arrest, but made his return in April 2002. He won the WWE Championship at No Way Out 2004. Then on November 13, 2005, he died suddenly. On Dark Side of the Ring, Eddie's nephew Chavo Guerrero Jr. recalled being awakened by hotel management. Eddie hadn't answered his wake-up call and Chavo found his uncle unresponsive in the bathroom. Eddie died in Chavo's arms from heart failure. WWE issued a corporate statement announcing Guerrero's passing and held the following Raw in his memory. Kurt Angle, a member of the SmackDown 6 along with Guerrero, recalled on the Cafe Day Renee podcast that Guerrero was showing signs of health problems earlier. There were days when he couldn't move. Uh, he would be backstage with a winter jacket on, with a hat on. He was walking around like an old man. Guerrero is survived by his wife, Vicky, their two daughters, and a daughter from another relationship. Plans were reportedly being put in place for Guerrero to face Shawn Michaels at WrestleMania 22. Instead, Guerrero was inducted into the Hall of Fame class of 2006 that weekend. In October 1999, Darren Draws Drozdoff worked what seemed like a pretty standard match with D'Lo Brown during a SmackDown taping in Uniondale, New York. But when Brown performed his signature sky-high sit-out powerbomb, something clearly went wrong. The match ended in a no contest and Draz was taken to the hospital. Life-saving neck surgery left him a quadriplegic. The footage of the move didn't air on SmackDown. It has only ever been used in a public service announcement warning viewers to not mimic the moves they see on TV. Brown told Title Match Wrestling that the incident marked the worst day in his personal and professional career. But Drozdov holds no animosity towards Brown, telling Fox Sports in 2014, I have no hard feelings toward D'Lo because shit happens. Thanks to modern medical technology, Draz has regained partial mobility above his waist. He continued to find work after retirement in the WWE writer's room and has produced online content such as pay-per-view predictions. He was often a guest on the Bite This web series. Under Armour founder Kevin Plank, a longtime friend of Drozdov's, provided the former wrestler with a state-of-the-art wheelchair to help fulfill his passion for hunting. The controversial loose cannon Brian Pillman signed with WWF in 1996 after a major car accident left him with a broken ankle. The injury forced Flying Brian to change his in-ring style to a more ground-based approach once he healed up. Pillman grew dependent on pills and alcohol to cope with his pain, making him even more erratic backstage. Housekeepers at a hotel found Pillman dead the day of the In Your House Bad Blood pay-per-view in October 1997. The wrestler had suffered a heart attack at just 35 years old. Pillman reportedly suffered from the same undetected hereditary heart defect that killed his father years earlier. Vince McMahon announced Pillman's death on the pay-per-view. A special tribute was held in the memory of Pillman the next night on Raw, with friends such as Steve Austin paying their respects. McMahon interviewed Pillman's widow, Melanie Pillman, asking her questions about what the future held for her family. The Wrestling Observer Newsletter Awards declared the interview as the most disgusting promotional tactic of 1997. After being stripped of the World Heavyweight Championship following his emotional win at WrestleMania 30, Daniel Bryan returned from injury to win the Intercontinental Championship at WrestleMania 31. But head injuries led to him being stripped of that title as well. WWE doctors wouldn't clear him to compete. In February 2016, Brian announced his retirement in front of a crowd of his fellow Washingtonians. Citing concerning cerebral scan results, Brian thanked the fans for being there with him in a career he started at 18 years old. Brian credited wrestling for leading him to meeting and eventually marrying his wife Brie Bella. Brian's voice cracked with heartbreak when he talked about the possibility of never wrestling again, but he was able to lead the crowd in one last yes chant. The following day, Brian revealed the full extent of his injuries on ESPN. One of the things that's been hard about this is that I have had post-concussion seizures that I've hid uh, for a long time. Brock Lesnar tipped his hat to Brian for prioritizing his health over wrestling, saying his retirement was a wise choice. 
Brian returned to competition at WrestleMania 34 after finally being cleared in February 2018. In October 2018, WWE Universal Champion Roman Reigns relinquished his title and announced he would be taking time off for leukemia treatment. Leaving the title in the ring, Reigns was greeted by his former Shield stablemates Seth Rollins and Dean Ambrose, who embraced him at the top of the entrance ramp. The cancer had returned after Reigns was first diagnosed with the illness at 22 after a physical. Fans and colleagues wish Reigns the best. Paul Heyman offered his thoughts and prayers to Reigns, describing himself as being in the presence of such courage and such greatness. Small pockets of the wrestling fan base accused the company of fabricating the diagnosis, with Reigns publicly denying the baseless claims. In February 2019, Reigns announced that he was in remission. Returning in a six-man tag match, Reigns main event in Fastlane 2019 with the Shield brethren to defeat Baron Corbin, Bobby Lashley, and Drew McIntyre. During the COVID-19 pandemic, Reigns' immunocompromised status led him to missing the first few months of Thunderdome tapings before returning at SummerSlam. Reigns is a spokesperson for the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society. In June 2007, Chris Benoit was scheduled to face CM Punk at Vengeance Night of Champions to crown a new ECW champion. Benoit was uncharacteristically absent from the house show loop leading up to the pay-per-view. He told Chavo Guerrero his family had food poisoning. Benoit then missed his flights to the pay-per-view, so WWE requested a wellness check. Atlanta police found Benoit, his wife Nancy, and their son Daniel dead in a grisly double murder-suicide. Close friends and relatives were left wondering how such a terrible thing could happen. Evidence suggests that CTE, substance abuse, domestic problems, and mental health issues contributed to what transpired that weekend. TMZ reported that the Benoits nearly divorced in 2003 with Nancy filing a restraining order. According to the Oklahoman, Benoit's name had also been on the DEA's radar because of a suspected connection to a steroid distribution network. Since the incident, WWE has scarcely mentioned Benoit, all but erasing him from wrestling history. While some fans advocate for his legacy to be remembered once again, others disagree. At an Inside the Ropes event, Paul Heyman said, Three people died in that house that night. Only one person had the choice behind it. If you or anyone you know is having suicidal thoughts, please call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline by dialing 988 or by calling 1-800-273-TALK-8255.